So the first thing, um, before I kind of get into the personal experience stuff, is when talking to again, groups that kind of think of themselves on the left, especially about the kind of American history and contemporary American politics, is to acknowledge forthrightly that there really is no left in America worth speaking of. Um, and this, I would say, is, back, is, is in fact both cause and consequence of what scholars and increasingly kind of uh, more kind of popular folks call neoliberalism, um, which I want to define very basically as capitalism devoid of opposition. Um, right? So, and what I mean by the left as a political force, right, is a grounded, um, is a movement grounded and sustained in institutions that are capable of, over time, exerting influence on the state and redrawing the moral boundaries of the market to include more and more things essentially as rights. That is to say, things like healthcare, like education, um, like a living wage are not, are not things that depend upon how much money is in your pocket. Um, so the consequence, though, um, of a lack of a left, I want to say first kind of throw out there is twofold, I would argue. First is there, since the late 1960s in American culture and American life, there's been a massive narrowing of expectations and expectations of what kind of life one can have, how one can influence the direction of government, and what the state can actually do for people. Um, and I want to come back to that perhaps a little later and say really what the kind of point of that is. Um, and second, um, and this is much more a product of, in fact, the first Clinton presidency, um, America has two parties committed that have share, share very basic principles. They're committed to more, ever more deregulated markets. They're committed to ever more privatization of state services. Um, and again, this is in many ways most, most dramatic, in fact, under President Clinton and arguably also under President Obama. Um, in fact, arguably much more dramatic than under Reagan himself. Um, generally, and there's exceptions in both parties, they're committed to a muscular foreign policy, foreign policy that uses America's military might to exert both economic and forceful influence around the world. Um, and they're committed to the delegitimation of various things, such as healthcare, education, and living wages as rights, that is to say, as citizenship rights. Um, so what separates the two parties, it's not, of course, unimportant, right? Um, the Democratic Party has a deep and abiding commitment to multiculturalism and the basic liberal self-ownership notion of the right of women to own their bodies. Um, again, not unimportant, but nonetheless, it's a vision of politics and a vision of kind of party politics that posits, to just give one example, that if 1% of the population controlled 50% of the wealth, this could actually be just, right, so long as 50% of that 1% is men, 14% is African American, 17% is Latino, right? 18% is gay, right? As long as it's equally distributed, right? It posits basically that. So that's essentially at the heart now of the difference between the Democratic and Republican parties. And again, not an unimportant difference. Um, so with that in mind, I want to back up a little bit to last winter, y'all's time, summer, um, um, in America, and uh, narrate a couple of little stories and to really kind of think about, um, again, the trajectory of the Sanders campaign and what I think it means long-term for American politics, and again, in relationship to this question around inequality, but also in terms of how um, all the great policies that Andrew talked about earlier coming out of Scandinavia, how one can actually build a force to actually imagine instituting those policies. Um, so I remember I was sitting around actually um, in Sydney in early August last year with a group of fairly prominent American labor historians, all would probably use the term socialist to some degree or another, and um, the oldest, um, the oldest of them asked kind of the dinner table why we weren't more excited about the Sanders campaign. Um, at that time, he had been drawing relatively large crowds. Um, he had been very much a kind of social media darling trending and whatnot. Um, but, you know, there was not really a sense that this was actually a campaign. For the other three of us at the table, the kind of broad sense was, one, this is just a protest candidacy of which America sees one every four years, essentially, right, both on the right and left. Um, Two, that it was a candidacy built, again, around a single personality, like Ralph Nader's candidacies before, like Jesse Jackson's before that. These were not movement building moments, right? They were moments of kind of individual charismatic leaders. And three, I think all of us shared a deep skepticism about electoral politics as a starting point of any kind of uh, activity, right? That is to say, electoral politics tends to be the end point. Um, so with this in mind, we were all, again, vaguely skeptical, again, August of last year. Um, and in my own case, I got vaguely involved in the campaign um, on the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina when I was asked to help draft the Sanders campaign's response to that, um, or uh, the, the thing they put up on the website. It's not the official response, um, which I did in the way that one helps friends move a couch, right? I mean, they ask you to move it and you do it. Um, it wasn't, you know, of course, Sanders was saying all the right things, whereas, of course, Obama as well as Clinton were not actually saying all the right things in the aftermath of Katrina. Um, I've been a New Orleanian resident for 25 years, so hence my involvement in that. Um, 
And so that was basically, essentially, I think for a lot of us, and again, I don't want to speak anyone, for anyone in particular, but for a lot of us, that was kind of our feeling of the Sanders campaign. Yeah, this is good, but you know, come October, come November, it's all going to kind of fade away, both in, the, both in respect to the fact that the Clinton campaign had so much money, had the kind of very much unspoken and premature that it was her party now, right, upon Obama's, that was the whole point of picking Joe Biden. He wasn't going to be old enough to run, or he was going to be too old to run, supposedly, right? Um, all these things were saying from, you know, back in 2008 when she essentially, you know, brokered the deal to become Secretary of State, she was going to be the next nominee. Um, and furthermore, most of us have a kind of deep distrust, as I talked about earlier, of the Democratic Party, right? I mean, I think that same cohort of people would say, you know, wake us up on Election Day and we'll go vote for the Democrat. But beyond that, it's not that big a deal um, in the context of, again, the kind of the long-term attempt to build right, an institutional force capable of challenging those things. So October goes on, November goes on, um, and all of a sudden, it seems like this is actually kind of, it's making the news. But the other thing that seems to be happening is it's not just rallies, right? I mean, what I, what I notice, again, amongst my students both here and then when I'm back in the US frequently is that it's actually just the, the beginnings of these conversations are being had that it hadn't been had entirely in my generation, right? And again, talking to people of uh, different, of older cohorts haven't really arguably been had since the late 1960s in the context of the US. And again, those are the, conver the very kind of basic Sanders conversations, right? That healthcare should be a right. Um, and it's a very different, very different thing to say than both what Obama says in terms of his um, Affordable Care Act and also what Clinton wants to do, right? Which is Clinton's best, one of the most indicative moments is in re regard to higher education where she, in response to Sanders's um, desire to make higher education a universal right and essentially free, she said that she thinks students should have skin in the game. And that's essentially what she means. That's what she means in regards to her preference for a lower minimum wage. That's what she has essentially meant in regards to health care, that these are not things that should be guaranteed as rights, but they're things that one has, they work both ways. And of course, in a role, um, very much a very central role in the basically elimination of welfare under her husband's presidency, that was very much, very much part of it, right? It was all about behavioral um, behavioral traits made you eligible for welfare, whereas behavioral traits also made you uneligible for welfare. Um, so there's a moment, you know, coming through basically the end of the f end of the spring, y'all's time, where again, where there's like, okay, now there's a great conversation happening, and this is actually an organizing moment, and this is when I began to get a little more involved, I would say, in certain levels. Um, at the same time, probably the most two unions um, and two of the more kind of important unions in the contemporary American landscape, the communication workers, um, who do all sorts of both, right now 40,000 are on strike against Verizon and the largest strike in the last five years in America, um, and the National Nurses Union, which has a very specific history um, coming out of some fights around California healthcare issues um, about five or six years ago, basically got together and also saw this conversation happening. And they formed a kind of corollary organization called Labor for Bernie. Um, of which various other unions, and especially union locals, have joined on. Um, so I think some of us saw this as perhaps, okay, here's a vehicle, right, where something longer term can be built, right? There, because very much along the kind of labor for Bernie campaign, while Sanders, of course, is very central, there's also the sense that this is, again, this was always, oops, um, this was always a moment, let me go the rest of my sheet, oh, I got it. <laughs> um, I mean, he's never going to win, is what we kept thinking, right? I mean, okay, but as long as we can basically keep this conversation going, we're playing with house money, right? Again, because at the national level, these conversations hadn't been had. And then at some point, and I would say for me, I think it's in mid-January, kind of right after Iowa and New Hampshire. So I get back to where I was. Um, there go. I think we all kind of woke up and, excuse my language, but said, holy shit, he could actually win this. Um, which then, of course, leads to a whole different calculus, right, in terms of what you begin to think about doing. Um, and so I think in large, and this is, again, the moment where he takes off. I mean, I, the amount of, um, you know, the amount of interviews I was doing here to talk about this stuff just skyrockets through the roof about Sanders in particular. He almost becomes as much a kind of fat fixture, and again, my anecdotal experience in Australia, as Trump does, right, and whereas Trump is constantly on the news here. Um, and so that's, and this is also the moment, right, where the, Again, that kind of, those conversations, those very simple conversations, and this is the beauty, I would argue, Sanders gets criticized this frequently, right, by Clinton, um, as well as many of her surrogates, for not having detailed policy proposals. 
um, for, you know, and I think the res correct response to her, A. Philip Randolph, who uh, was arguably, I would argue, actually the most important civil rights leader, in a, certainly in the 20th century, um, the man who basically organized the March on Washington, um, longtime president of the Bro Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the largest black union, famously replied to a kind of opponent in the mid-1960s, the point is to have a program and not programs, right? And Sanders was very much putting a program out there. Um, and again, a very basic, you know, de-escalating American foreign policy, um, again, a right to education, a right to health care, um, and a right to a living wage combined with a very much a kind of a specific, I don't know, should we say attack, right, where he's saying the reason you don't have this is the, basically the financialization of the economy as a whole and the con massive control of financial interests of American politics. Um, so again, this kind of moment from January and depending upon who you are, arguably last Tuesday, I think at the latest, when there's really a chance, when people feel like there's actually a chance. Um, again, this is a moment for massive conversations, then all these other kind of conversations start happening, including, just to point to a, two, uh, a few, um, during, I think that was the, it was not the last debate, it was the debate before, when San Sanders refused to, so we say, um, disavow some of the social gains of Cuba. Um, he, you know, did whatever American politician has to do and say, yes, you know, the Castro's need to go, it's a dictatorship, freedom, but, you know, Cuban health care is an immensely incredible achievement. The Cuban literacy rate is an immensely incredible achievement. The fact that Cuba spent more money on Ebola fighting than the U.S. did is an immensely incredible achievement, right? Um, and the fact that Sanders refused to acknowledge it. Um, I mean, and frankly, no major American politician could have said, would have ever said anything like that. Um, similarly, her attacking, and again, I was hoping to talk a little bit more, more about Latin America. I think, in particular, what's going on in Brazil right now is an incredibly important thing that's not getting enough attention um, amongst folks like us. Um, but his attack on Clinton in that same debate for her support as Secretary of State for the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Honduras, her more recent, his more recently attack on Clinton for her unwavering support of Israel in relationship to basically everything. Um, and again, an incredibly actually brave thing to do in the context of the lead up to New York primary where Jewish voters and pro, I should say actually pro-Israel voters make up a solid probably 25% of that Democratic Party electorate. Um, so from last Tuesday, if you want to date it the latest, I think a lot of us, it was after he couldn't really close the deal in Illinois um, and Michigan. From now on, we're back to that point, I think, where we were thinking, we were thinking we were when we just started this, right? Which is, okay, this is a way to basically organize something long-term. It's a way to, again, have these conversations on a national level that hadn't really been had. Um, and so that leads, I mean, first the basic thing is we're still playing with house money, right? And as long as he's kind of on the national stage, these are things that are incredibly useful. Um, and he's not going anywhere, I would say, until, certainly until after California, but probably until the convention. Um, but there's a series of questions um, that I think are kind of foremost in a lot of people's minds. First is what Bernie himself will do. Um, despite the fact that I think the gains of this moment, and again, I think they are the most impressive gains, frankly, I've ever seen in American politics. Um, the gains of this moment, I think they're beyond his own individual leadership, his own charisma, but nonetheless, how people start connecting with these same ideas without him as a figure becomes incredibly important. Um, and similarly, one of the things that's, I mean, fascinating about that, and a little bit of inside baseball is, no one really knows who talks to him. Like it's a really it's a really interesting campaign in that regard, and basically it was a bunch of it was a bunch of folks who went up to Vermont in the mid late '60s to get away from New York. They were all you know self-described socialists, very anti-war, very pro civil rights, and they sat around their basements talking about this stuff for 30 years. All of a sudden, Bernie Sanders is you know a national presidential candidate, but it's the same guys he's been talking to. So all that's to say, there's a weird disconnect up at the kind of top of the campaign. Um, but what will become in particular of these disconnected supporters? That is to say, a lot of the people who have deep misgivings about Clinton. Um, and how can this kind of broad group of people, of five, six million donors, people, again, who, if I would say, voting is perhaps the most passive political act one can engage in, they're actually, these are people who are actually clicking on a button to give 10, 20, 15 dollars once a week, once every month when they have the chance. How can those people be engaged long term? Um, and how can they connect with what I would argue are the various kind of vague beachheads for progressive politics in America, in particular Chicago, the city of Chicago as a whole, and what the Chicago Teachers Union has been able to, the fights they've been able to put up, I guess I should say, against Clinton's good friend, against Obama's good friend, Rahm Emanuel, and the massive kind of austerity policies there, um, and a few other examples. Um, 
But I want to step back really quick while I've still got a few minutes, I think, um, to really talk about what I, what I see in particular as the victories of the campaign so far. Um, and I think I would assume a lot of people in this room would agree that, or would agree that, in, well, let's, let me step back. In Americans, again, people, those of us who would kind of broadly identify as socialists, have always kind of argued that the vast, you know, if you look at the public opinion polling right, if you talk to actually talk to people, most people agree that healthcare should be a right, actually. And that's well, and what you were saying is I would actually disagree with that. If you phrase it in the very basic way, most people completely agree that affordable healthcare should be right. The question is how you get there, right? Um, most people agree that higher education should be a right. Most people agree minimum wages should be higher. Most people, except for in times of kind of like post 9 11, tend to be actually much less muscular about more American foreign policy when put to them in regards to specific issues. Um, and most people have a deep, deep distrust of the financial class in America, right? I mean, all of these things, I mean, majority, 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 right? Beyond that, though, and I think Sanders' campaign has demonstrated that what we've always suspected is actually quite true, that there is a popular base to organize around these issues um, and to actually turn them into a national political agenda. Um, and, but I think the other thing, and this is the one that's going to be long-term, be tough, um, and there's going to have to be a lot of you know, tough conversations, that some I've had myself, um, is that I think it's, this campaign has really sharpened the contradictions within American, what it would maybe self-describe as progressivism. Right? I mean, I don't know if you guys were following, but during the whole, there was a moment in the Clinton-Sanders debate where one of the debates where Clinton was like, no, I'm, not, I'm definitely a progressive. I'm definitely a progressive. Um, the, the people, the large group of people who have come to back Clinton, basically the vast majority of Clinton's backers are upper middle class, if you will. Um, that is to say her support is coming largely, to her, she's massively disproportionately polling Sanders amongst upper middle class people and Southern African Americans. And I'm happy to talk about the African-American question, um, maybe in a QA. and a um, But the vast majority of her support has come from these kinds of folks. Um, and it's tend to come from a very much what Thomas Frank has recently taken to call the liberal elite or the liberal class. Um, this is a group of, it's a group of economists, professors, lawyers, right, political power brokers, who I would argue are largely dismissive in various ways of working class Americans across the kind of cultural spectrum. Um, and they've been immensely dismissive of Sanders. Um, they, again, I think they kind of constitute a class, but this is a group of people who largely don't see things like healthcare as something that needs to be made a right. It's a problem that needs a technocratic fix, right? They don't see higher education as something that should be a right. It's something, well, some people should have the right if they want to, but then if you want to become a welder, why go to university, right? Why learn about you know, ideas anyway, if, if you're just gonna weld stuff. So we should craft a little policy around that, right? Um, it's the group of people who find Sanders is, again, kind of anti-muscular foreign policy um, against American interests and therefore essentially wrong and also, you know, quote unquote, naive. Um, and again, within those kind of contradictions, and this is where you kind of, some famous names like Paul Krugman, right, has come out and very much kind of blasted Sanders for a lot of these issues. Um, and I would say, again, this is where you really are getting these contradictions. And what I want to kind of back up and say from that is, the imagined constituency that is going to institute these policies might not include a good portion of the Democratic Party today. Um, I think as uh, Andrew was saying before, that there is a sense that there is a kind of breakup going on um, in parties, not just in the United States, right, but across, across the world. Um, and of course, in the United States, the thing that's getting the most attention is Republicans. But again, I think there is a massive kind of fraying within the Democratic Party in the United States. And some, the question of what becomes of actually, actually the kind of mass and the majority of Americans who actually want these policies, who make well below the median wage, um, who are frankly struggling on a very day-to-day -day level, where they're gonna find their kind of, where they're gonna find a kind of political movement, but also where they're gonna be able to get involved to change those things becomes especially important. Um, and so I think one of the, again, one of the things that, one of the great benefits that I think this candidacy has done and where it goes from here becomes very much up in the air is to really put those two con contra things on the table. One, that again, pushing for a universalistic policy and again, universalistic kind of social rights in particular is something that can organize people. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk about kind of more accidental stuff around that too. Um, 
And then furthermore, the Democratic Party, um, and I would probably dispute Andrew's statement about this earlier, Hillary Clinton's not going to the left. Um, and this is, you know, if you spend time in the US every two years, every four years, this is the classic narrative, right? Um, and I mean, uh, when I, it's probably as a little older audience who might get this, but it's, it's the classic version of the booty call. Right? I mean, this is what the Democratic Party does to the American, American progressives every four years. Yeah, yeah, we're going to move left. And, but we know you're really not going to call tomorrow. And we know you're not going to call tomorrow, but you know, you're still better than that guy, right? Um, and that's what, you know, and that's what's going to happen, right? I mean, and you can see this in hints in all sorts of ways, right? But so even stepping back from that aspect, right, to say that not simply is this a centrist party, but the long history of Clintonism, frankly, really does need to get disavowed by any kind of respectable progressive party. That is to say, the history that took public housing out of the, basically destroyed public housing in America. The history that, that destroyed welfare. The history that really deregulated Wall Street. And a history that was part and parcel of the invasion of Iraq. All these things can't really have a place in the American Democratic Party if it's really to be democratic. So I'll stop there, but happy to take questions.